So today we cover section 11.1, .1, sequences. So this is the last stretch of this class. We have pretty much finished uh, integration and all the related techniques. Now we have a very different topic. Uh, but there will be connections uh, between sequences and series and integration, uh, at, as will become apparent. But today we just uh, uh, talk about basic notions and definitions. Very easy chapter. So a sequence um, is nothing but a, a list of numbers uh, written in a certain order. So we can say A1, A2, uh, AN, dot, dot, dot. So in this class, we'll be dealing with infinite sequences. So the, it's an infinite number uh, of uh, terms. So this is called the first term. This is the second term. Um, and this is the nth, nth term. Okay, These are the um, words that we'll be using a lot. Uh, there are three ways to denote a sequence. Okay, so uh, this is notation number one. Notation number two uh, is like this. A n. Uh, so this means that we have a bunch of numbers. Uh, and they are called A1, A2, and so on, right? So this is a shorthand notation. And notation number three uh, is this. A n, where n changes from 1 to infinity. So the uh, subscript tells you where n starts, usually at 1, sometimes at 0. And it goes uh, all the way up to infinity. So. Um, uh, for example, so let's let's consider um, the following sequence: um, one half, two thirds, three quarters, four fifth. Dot dot dot. Okay. So let's do, let's figure out. Um, how this can be written as one formula. So as you look at this, you can discern a pattern. What's the pattern? When n equals 1, the numerator is 1, and the denominator is 2. When n equals 2, the numerator is 2, and the denominator is 3. When n equals 3, uh, so the, you can see that the numerator is always given by n, and the denominator is uh, that plus 1. So uh, this is the same as to say that it's n divided by n plus 1, where n goes from 1 to infinity. Or we can say that a n is given by n, n plus 1. Right? So by looking at this pattern, uh, by looking at the first few terms of the sequence, we were able to get a pattern. And we were able to come up with uh, this expression which tells you the general term. Now I can say what is A100 is. That will be 100 divided by 101. Uh, how about this one? Zero, one, square root of two, square root of three, square root of four, like this. Okay? So, you can see that um, there is a pattern here, too, be because even though it looks like the square roots start from the third one, really we can put them here, too, right? These are all square roots. So we can say that an is going to be a square root of something. Of what? So when n equals uh, 1, we have a square root of uh, 0 n equals 2, we have a square root of 1. So what is, a, what, the, what is the square root of for a general n? n minus 1. Okay, So we can say that this is square root of n minus 1 
from 1 to infinity. Okay? So we're going, we're going from particular to general. Another one, another example that is useful is like this. So Okay, so let's find a general term here. It's more complicated. First thing that you notice is that the sign alternates of plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So every time we see something like this, there's a trick to do it. So we have to say that a n is going to be a multiple of minus 1 to a certain power. So actually, let me start like this. So consider minus 1 to the power of n. What, what is the sequence? Uh, so when n is 0, well, I'm sorry, when n is 1, we'll get minus 1. n is 2, we'll get 1. n is 3, we'll get minus 1. So this is a little device that makes alternating uh, signs, plus, minus 1, plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. But uh, written like this, the first term is a, uh, has a minus sign, right? So how, how can I make the first term positive? I multiply by minus 1, or you can say <coughs> like this, right? So in this case, when n equals 1, I have minus 1 squared, so that's plus 1. <coughs> n equals 2, I get minus 1. n equals 3, plus 1, and so on. So this gives me the right sign, OK? Uh, I have more stuff going on. So uh, the easier part is the numerator. I think it goes 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So when n equals 1, we get 3, so it's n plus 2. You can see that, right? n plus 2. And in the denominator, what do you see? 5, 25. These are powers of 5. So this is the first power. So when n equals 1, we have the first power of 5. This is the second, and so on. So it's 5 to the n. So this is my general term, a n, for this particular case. See, step by step, we were able to reconstruct the whole pattern. OK, question? Um, now, um, there are several famous uh, sequences. OK, so something that uh, I want to tell you is uh, the Fibonacci sequence. So Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who uh, became interested in the reproduction of rabbits and how quickly they reproduce and their numbers increase. Uh, so he came up with the following sequence. Uh, so let's suppose that f1 is 1, OK? And f2 is uh, 1. And then we define uh, fn is defined recursively. to be given by f n minus 1 plus f n minus 2. What does it mean? To create f n, we take the previous two and add them together. So what does it mean? I know f1 f and f2, they are given. What's f3? We have to take f1 plus f2. 1 plus 1 is 2. f4, I have to add two, f2 plus f3. And by the way, before all the sequences I denoted as a n, this is f n, f n, right? But it doesn't matter. It's just a notation. Uh, f for Fibonacci, famous <coughs> guy. So uh, I have to add f two and f three. So f two is uh, f two is one, and f three is two. So I have one plus two is three. Next, f five is f three plus f four. F three is two, and uh, the next one is three is five. Okay, let me do one more f6 is f4 plus f5 uh, is uh, 3 plus 5 is 8, etc. 
Okay, so rabbits, it has very little to do with rabbits, it turns out, but it describes many other beautiful things in nature. For instance, um, if you look at a pineapple or a sunflower, you can see certain spiral structures as, uh, as the seeds are formed. And I cannot draw it, I didn't draw it well. There are several spirals that emanate from the middle, like this. So, so this is like looking at the sunflower or, for, or, or, or onto a pine cone from, from the top, right? So it turns out that uh, these spirals are described by using Fibonacci sequences. And the, there are many scientists who are trying to explain this universal pattern in nature. Why does nature like the sequence so much? And uh, there are many interesting explanations of that. Uh, okay, another, and so here uh, we can very easily uh, figure out what the next term is. So here we need a little bit more work because we, we have to know the previous terms. Here we don't need any work. We just substitute the number n and we calculate the term. So this is given by just one function. In other sequences, we don't have an easy way to determine the next term. Uh, I'll give you one example of such a sequence. Uh, uh, so number of students enrolled in math to be in year n is given by a n. Okay? So this is a sequence uh, whose numbers are un unpredictable. Okay, but it, uh, I don't, we don't have a formula for this. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we have uh, uh, a sequence associated with this. Um, how do we plot sequences? So let me show you. Uh, so presenting sequences. So how do we present a function? We usually plot it, right? f of x, we plot it as a function of x. With sequences, uh, we can do the same thing. So one way of doing it is a graph. So for example, let's suppose that a n is given by um, n over n plus 1. I think this is our first example. Yes, this one. Okay. So how can we view this? We just simply set n to be our horizontal axis. And so we only have discrete values. One, two, three, four, and so on. The first number is one half. Then we have three quarters. Uh, no, two thirds. Then we have three quarters. And so on. Like this. And we can even connect it, right? Although the lines connecting the dots don't mean anything, really. Uh, it, it's only the points that count. So this is a kind of a discrete function. Um, and so this is the first way of representing this sequence. The second way um, is called the number line. So let's suppose that this is 0 and this is 1. Okay, and I'm going to put a point on this line that corresponds to each uh, consecutive term. So the first term is one half. The next term is uh, two thirds. The next next one is three quarters. Then I have four fifth. And I put, uh, I continue to put these points, and I can see that they become denser and denser, uh, closer and closer together. For, for, for this particular example. Uh, you can also see that here we don't have a constant slope. It becomes uh, flatter and flatter, the slide. Somehow we feel that this thing may have a horizontal asymptote. Okay? It may have a limit. So, uh, and uh, indeed it does. Let's define a limit of a sequence. So we can talk. about a limit L of a sequence. 
Um, so formally speaking, um, a sequence a n has the limit l um, and we write so this is notation it must look familiar limit as n goes to infinity of a n is l or we can also write a n goes to l as n goes to infinity okay so this happens if for any epsilon greater than zero there is a number n integer such that if n is greater than n then a n minus l is less than epsilon okay so if something has a limit it means that it gets to this uh, number l uh, arbitrarily close okay and it never leaves the vicinity once it's there it's going to stay there so let's suppose that my limit uh, is l let me measure like one percent uh, error let's suppose that i want to reach L within the precision of 1%. Uh, the fact that the, the sequence has a limit L means that I can find a number N, for instance, 1 million, such that after this number, all the AN, ANs are going to be within that precision of the number L. Okay. So this is exactly the same definition as you remember for functions. So this epsilon works like a trap. Let's suppose that this is L, and my sequence starts somewhere far away. So A1, A2, and then I go A3, could be anywhere. But let's suppose that I know that it has a limit. It means that uh, for arbitrary epsilon, I can put a bracket like this. So this, uh, this length is epsilon, this length is epsilon. And this, uh, eventually, starting from a certain number n, the sequence is going to be trapped within this trap and never escape. So as the sequence jumps up and down, or doesn't, at some point it's going to enter this uh, interval, and it's going to remain there forever, starting from that number n. Okay? And then I can make the trap smaller. I can make it, make it very small like this. So this is epsilon. So it's going to take a long time until it uh, gets there, but eventually it will. Maybe it will take a million iterations until uh, you're inside. But once you're there, you, you stay inside. So this is the uh, explanation uh, of this definition. Um, how do we, in practice, find out uh, whether a sequence has a limit? So. Let's find the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence. Okay. Do you have any questions? Questions? OK. Um, so in this case, uh, we can perform the following manipulations. We can say that n, n plus 1 uh, is the same as n plus 1 minus 1. Remember, we did this with integrals sometimes. We add and subtract the same number, and it remains the same. And now we can write this as 1 minus this. Okay. Uh, so the limit of this is the same as the limit of 1, this. And what is the limit of? this sequence as n goes to infinity? Zero. As n goes of, of this. 
the limit of this. Uh, so the, uh, the limit of the whole thing you're right is one, uno. <laughs> Uh, the limit of this is, of course, zero, right? As n increases uh, indefinitely, this goes to zero, right? So we can say that the limit is equal to one. Um, okay. So uh, not all sequences have limits. A uh, question? For that limit, you can use the too, right? Because it's an indefinite form. Yes, uh, you can. Except, uh, so this is one of those cases when, when you don't really need L'Hopital. And uh, so let's consider a function. So very often, if the sequence uh, is given like this analytically, if we have a general formula, we can use uh, functions. Okay, let's suppose that the function f uh, is given by this, right? And then we can find the limit of the function. And if we know the limit of the function, it's going to be the same as the li limit of the sequence. So how would we find the limit? as x goes to infinity of this function. One could apply L'Hopital, but the easier trick that we usually learn is the following. We divide the numerator and denominator by x, right? So we have 1. And now we notice that 1 over x goes to 0, and it's 1. Okay. So in this case, L'Hopital is not necessary, but there will be other examples, I think, today, where we, will, uh, we can use L'Hopital. And L'Hopital rule only applies to functions of a continuous variable. But we can always translate our results for the function to sequences. Uh, so um, we can uh, actually write it as a theorem, OK? Suppose. We, we know uh, suppose that a n is given some by some function f of n okay then if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to l then the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is the same thing. So this is exactly what I just did. I looked at a n. I expressed it as a function of a continuous variable x, calculated the limit, and the limit is the same for the sequence as it is for the corresponding function. Okay. So this is something uh, that allows us to apply calculus to a, to sequences, as long as we know the formula for a n. Okay, I'll show you some examples where we don't have a formula for a n. Oh, in fact, we already had an example. Remember Fibonacci sequence? Uh, there is no functional form there. That sequence is not given by a function. It's given um, um, sequentially. Okay, uh, so th this theory would not be useful in this case, in the case of Fibonacci uh, sequence. Um, one more um, statement with regards to limits. Some sequences increase indefinitely. So definition. So if we say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is equal to infinity, this means that uh, for any m, there is a number n such that if n is greater than n, a n is greater than m. So let me show you an example. Consider the sequence was a n given by n squared. What is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n? Mm -hmm. 
What do you think? What happens to n squared as n goes to infinity? It also goes to infinity. What does it mean? If I plot it, it goes like this. It kind of outlines uh, a parabola point by point. Okay. Uh, and if I want to set a limit, like let, let me choose a really big number m, five million. Okay. There is going to be a number n start, starting from which we are bigger than this. Let me take ten million. This is another m capital. Then starting from here, we are going to be even bigger. And no matter where I put the upper limit, it's going to exceed it starting from a certain number n. So this is what uh, this definition says. Okay. Questions? Okay. Uh, so there are several um, results that apply to limits of sequences just as they do to the limits of functions. So <coughs> if a n and b n are convergent, <coughs> so what does it mean convergent? Convergent means that they have a finite limit. Have a finite limit. Okay. Then we can talk about the limit as n goes to infinity of their sum. So the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Okay. Uh, we can talk about the limit of a number times a sequence. So we take a sequence that has a limit. Multiply each term of that sequence by 5. What's going to be the limit of the new sequence? It's the old limit times c. So it's c times the limit uh, of a n. Um, and let me put etc here to save time. You have a similar theorem about a product of two sequences. You have a similar result for uh, the ratio, the difference. And the power, okay? So, the, and it's all the same as uh, we had for functions, okay? No difference. The squeeze theorem, what's the squeeze theorem? Uh, so, in Russian, this theorem is called the theorem about two policemen. Do you know that? So, uh, that's what they taught me. Like, so let's suppose that we have a sequence that we don't know the behavior, behavior of. And we have two policemen. One is approaching on this side from below. Okay? And the, the other one is approaching from above. And, and they both go to the same place, right? So the criminal cannot escape. It has no where to go. So if the limit uh, of a n uh, and the limit of b n. So these are the, uh, the two policemen, a and b, is equal to L. And uh, a n and b n surround. CN, this is the criminal. C is for criminal. <laughs> I'm just making it up. Uh, so uh, the one is always bigger and the other one is always smaller. Then the criminal has no place to go except L. Okay? So if we have two sequences who, whose limit we know, and they're on the, both, on, on the two sides of uh, the unknown sequence, we can conclude about the limiting behavior of that uh, sequence, okay? Uh, and another simple theorem <coughs> is uh, if we know that the limit of the absolute value is zero, then 
the limit of the sequence itself is also zero. So if the absolute value of a cer certain sequence tends to zero, then uh, the sequence uh, with uh, changing signs will have the same behavior. Okay. Uh, so I want to um, consider some examples of different types of behavior. So it starts very simple, OK? Suppose a n is equal to 5. Does a n converge? Yes, because it's a very boring sequence. It goes like this. This is 5. And the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is 5. That's completely obvious. Okay. Uh, next, let's suppose that a n is given by minus 1 to the n. Does a n converge? OK. What's the answer? No. No, because it behaves like this. The first term is negative, minus 1. And then it's positive, negative, positive, like this. And it keeps oscillating. It never approaches uh, any particular number. It keeps jumping. Okay, So no. Okay. And you can prove it by using the n epsilon uh, definition. That's really easy. Uh, what's next? Next example. So let's look at the same question. Does it converge? n square root of 1 plus n. Does this converge? OK. So how do I approach this? Th this uh, is easy because um, my, fun uh, my uh, sequence is given by a, a, a function of n. OK, so we consider the relevant function, which looks like this. So we have x over 1 plus x. OK, and we have to calculate the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. If this converges to a certain limit, then so does uh, the sequence. Uh, so we have x over square root of 1 plus x. Uh, so we can divide uh, everything by x, the numerator and denominator, right? So we have uh, 1 over x squared plus uh, 1 over x. What happens to this? So x goes to infinity. What happens to the denominator? Zero. zero. What happens to this sequence if its denominator goes to zero? It goes to infinity, right? So the denominator becomes uh, vanishingly small as x becomes large. So the whole thing uh, actually blows up. Uh, therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy is also infinity. So we use the knowledge of the corresponding function and its limit to conclude stuff about the um, sequence. Oh, here's L'Hopital. OK, you asked me for L'Hopital. I'll give you L'Hopital. So how about uh, an is given by log n over n. So we consider f of x which is log x over x. What is the limit as x goes to infinity of log x over x? Right. So now it's not a bunch of powers. Uh, and d dividing through by uh, x obviously won't help, so we use L'Hopital. Uh, we can say that this is infinity over infinity. So we take 
uh, the derivative of uh, numerator uh, and denominator. So I have 1 over x, so the limit is equal to 0. Okay? Therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of log n over n is also 0. Questions? OK. Uh, so remember this little theorem here. Uh, let's apply this one. So let's suppose that a n is one, minus 1 to the n over n squared. OK. Uh, what is uh, the limit of this? This theorem tells me that if I know something about the absolute value of the sequence, then and if it go to, goes to 0, so, so, then so does the sequence itself. So consider the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute values. Okay. This way, I can ignore the minus 1 to the n. Uh, so this is the limit of simply 1 over n squared. Okay. So this is easy, right? As n goes to infinity, 1 over n squared goes to 0. And then I apply theorem. And I conclude that the limit uh, of the actual uh, sequence is also 0. Questions? Question? Wouldn't the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared be infinity? So uh, n goes to infinity. Uh, so we can think of it as, uh, for instance, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, right? So what happens here? Right? Yeah. So it, go it goes the other way. n grows, 1 over n squared decays. Um, very good. Um, Oh, and there are some general results uh, that apply to this kind of sequence. So consider the sequence a n given by 1 over a, I'm sorry, over n to the power p. When does this converge? Right? So this is the question that I want to uh, ask. Let's just look at the notation. Am I using the right notation? I don't know. So. If p equals 0, then we can say that a n is equal to 1 converges. If p is equal to minus 1, a n is 1 over n to the minus 1, so it's n, it diverges. If p is equal to plus 1, a n is 1 over n converges. So somehow we can see that depending on the sign of p, this uh, sequence behaves differently. Okay. One can show that if p is greater or, or equal to 0, a n converges. So this example that we just looked at involved 1 over n squared. This corresponds to p equals 2. OK. The next uh, definition is that of a sequence bounded above and below.
if there is a number m such that n, a n is less or, or equal to m for all n, then we can say that a n is bounded from above. This definition says that there is a roof such that this uh, sequence doesn't pass through the roof. It never becomes greater than n. We can limit uh, the sequence by this roof, by this large number, such that it never exceeds it. Uh, and if uh, there is a number m such that a m is greater or equal than m for all n, then we can say that a n is bounded from below. Okay. For example, so let's suppose that a n <laughs> is n squared. Is this bounded from above? No, it keeps increasing. Is it bounded from below? Yeah. Yes. By what? Zero. Zero or 1, or minus 35, or any of these numbers, right? So it's bounded from below. For example, by m equals 0, not bounded from above. OK, uh, a few more definitions. Um, if a sequence satisfies a n plus 1 is greater or equal than <coughs> a n, then sequence a n is increasing. If a sequence satisfies a n plus 1 is less than a n, then a n is decreasing. OK? For example, look at the sequence 3 divided by n plus 5. I want to show that this is a decreasing sequence. How do we show this? Uh, so a n is given by 3 over n plus 5. And a n plus 1 is given by 3 divided by n plus 1 plus 5. So it's 3 over n plus 6. Therefore, I can say that a n is 3 over n plus 5 is less than 3 over n plus 6, which is a n plus 1. So a n is less than a n plus 1. I got it wrong, right? Yes. It's greater, greater, sorry. So it's decreasing. How else can you show that this is a decreasing sequence? You can see that this is a simple function. f of x is 3 over x plus 5. And you can show that the function is decreasing by calculating its derivative. You can see that for any value of x, the derivative of this function is uh, negative. So the function decreases. Therefore, the sequence decreases. So there are two ways uh, to show that the, this uh, sequence is decreasing. Two more definitions. No, one more definition. A C 
sequence that is increasing or decreasing is called monotonic. Okay, and uh, related to this, there's an important theorem uh, which I wanted to give you. It's called the monotonic sequence theorem. And it's very simple. Every bounded monotonic sequence is convergent. Okay. So let me show you some examples really quickly. So let's suppose that a n is given by minus 1 to the n. I want to ask you, is it, mo is it monotonic and is it bounded? So for sure, this guy is bounded. Plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. So it's bounded by minus 2 or plus 2. So it's bound bounded. Is it monotonic? Is it decreasing or increasing? Neither. Not monotonic. Does it have a limit? No, we already established that it jumps around, doesn't have a limit. Okay, no limit. Uh, okay, how about this one? Uh, N cubed. Is it bounded? <coughs> no, it's not bounded from above, not bounded from above, above. Is it monotonic? Yes. Increases monotonically, so monotonic. Does it have a limit? Uh, no, no limit. So to these two, uh, the theorem actually doesn't apply. The last example is when it, it does apply. So let's consider a n given by n, n plus 1, OK? Uh, so you can say that all, all the uh, values a n for sure are greater than 0, but they are also smaller than 1, right? Because we divide by something that is greater than the numerator. So this guy is bounded. Okay. Is it monotonic? So um, we can take the derivative of the corresponding function, or we can plot it. We already plotted it. It looks like this. So we say yes. Therefore, the uh, theorem applies. It has a limit. And in fact, we know that L equals 1. Question? Not necessarily. No, no, no. They don't have to be a fraction. Uh, we'll have many examples. Uh, uh, so, for instance, uh, a n is e to the minus n squared. That. Okay. Thank you.